AI in the courtroom, and the implications of bias. I'm Tanya Hall, and joining me is Catherine B. Forrest, former U.S. District Judge for the Southern District of New York, former Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Department of Justice Antitrust Division, and now a partner at Cravath, Swain, and more. Welcome, Catherine. Thanks for having me. I highlighted some of your legal roles in our introduction. Explain, if you will, how you came about your uh, technology expertise. So my technology uh, interest uh, really predates any of my the professional titles and uh, areas that you have uh, talked about in terms of my uh, introduction. And it goes back to a, um, an amateur interest that I've always had in quantum physics and also a uh, sort of an amateur interest in military history. And these two pieces have been sort of married together and I'm doing some work right now on an autonomous weaponry and that's why I sort of put in the uh, military uh, history piece of it. But I always had an interest in uh, quantum physics which uh, led me to a study of theories of consciousness which led me in, then into artificial intelligence. I had that interest uh, in parallel as I was proceeding sort of professionally uh, in a law firm where I did a lot of the early internet cases in the late 90s. And then I uh, went on to the bench eventually as a judge, uh, continued to do some uh, technology work on the bench. I did a number of uh, highly technical patent cases, came off the bench and already had a, uh, an interest and had been starting to do speaking on artificial intelligence and intellectual property. And then that work now has, uh, has really sort of uh, taken on a life of its own. And I do a majority of work and thinking in the AI area. How are you seeing artificial intelligence being used in the court system today? AI today uh, is being used really in all aspects of the legal process. People originally thought of AI uh, and the legal world as uh, only having to do with document discovery, which is sort of the uh, way in which two parties to a court proceeding are able to get documents and materials from one another. And there's AI now uh, that is able to, with predictive coding, is able to help you sort through literally millions and millions of pages of uh, electronic materials. That's what people think of in terms of AI and the court system. But in fact, AI is, is used in all aspects of, a, uh, of many judicial proceedings. And so let me use the criminal area as an example because I think it gives us a good overview. Uh, AI is used really right at the beginning for some predictive policing. And in New York City, there's something called the Domain Awareness System, DAS, which is a joint, uh, actually a joint venture between Microsoft and the NYPD, where they developed uh, DAS. And uh, that actually allows for a host of information uh, to be applied in the uh, area of policing within New York City, as an example, that also has been licensed to a number of other jurisdictions. And it utilizes AI to predict locations of various people, what's going to be happening, uh, whether or not a gunshot is in fact, a, or a noise is in fact a gunshot. There is some facial recognition technology that's also utilized with certain kinds of crowd control uh, and the identification of suspects. Uh, they use facial recognition along with video feed from a variety of, uh, of areas. So predictive policing in the DAS system is sort of like, if, if you wanna think of it, the beginning part of a process which may or may not result in a criminal case. You bring that then into a case that's brought by a prosecutor, and then you do have the ability of AI now to actually assist with the collection uh, and the um, synthesis of evidence. So for instance, right now there are AI tools which allow you to take a wiretap and, and audio recording from a wiretap and a video, if you've, got a, if you've got a video feed from a poll camera and allow you to take documents to feed it into a central database. And the AI can then actually not only recognize voices much better, of course, than the humans can, recognize faces often better, not always, than a human can, but it can put together these diverse areas 
of information and create sort of a matrix, if you will, of evidence. So for instance, uh, there will be uh, an ability, and there is an ability now to create, uh, here's the witness, and here is every person that the witness has a connection to uh, drawn as like a little sort of spider map, and you might have the witness and uh, the victim in different parts of that sort of spider map. And it's the way they get to that is through the utilization of this AI technology that's synthesizing huge amounts of data and putting it together. It of course has to be validated and checked by a human, but that then is a very different process than putting it together in the first instance. So that's the putting together, if you will, of the case. Then let's assume for the moment that there is a conviction of a uh, criminal defendant, either through a plea or through uh, a trial. And a judge then is trying to determine what an appropriate sentence is. There are different kinds of software uh, and the state system is different from the federal system in this regard in very important ways. But there are software on, on both the state and federal side, which is being used to predict violence, predict recidivism, predict the likelihood of compliance with release terms, uh, to predict w uh, the risk level for classification and housing purposes, and all of that is being done through sort of these predictive algorithms, uh, some of which can be bought off the shelf. The federal has developed their own system. And so it's utilized then in terms of sentencing and then by the Bureau of Prisons, for instance, in the federal system for ease and even housing uh, an individual at the, time, um, at the time of incarceration. So it's really being used throughout the entirety of, uh, of the legal process today. So in those applications, how does the subject of algorithmic or data set bias come up? This is, I think, a, a very, very important point because AI, as uh, your audience is undoubtedly aware of, AI uh, is only learns what, it's, uh, what it can learn from data sets and from what it's been exposed to, from the information that it's exposed to. And your data is only as good as uh, as the historical moment when it was recorded is. So in the uh, situation where we're talking about, let's talk about this uh, recidivism software, the software that's predicting uh, the risk of recidivism. This is a very good example of this. Uh, a lot of the data that's used to train the AI is historical data on arrest records. So the arrest records, if you will, are snapshots of a moment in time uh, and there will be thousands and thousands of these arrest records. And that moment in time may in fact be reflective of particular policing policies with which some people may no longer agree. The community standards may have changed in terms of the acceptable policing policies. So for instance, stop and frisk. If you've got arrest records drawn from a New York City database uh, uh, or in other parts of the country as well, which did stop and frisk, and you believe that there has been an over arrest of one population versus another, those arrest records that are from that period of time going into the 2000 era are going to be reflective of that kind of um, policy. So you're going to have then a series uh, and data point uh, of arrests that are gonna be reflective then perhaps of an over arrest, for instance, of young black men. And that can then lead the AI to be trained on a data set, which may no longer be reflective of what people believe is an appropriate data set for training AI on the risks of recidivism. Do we want to train our AI on a recidivism risk where the AI, if it's going to be developing its own inputs and weightings, whether it's going to then overemphasize race, for instance, uh, as a weighting, uh, as, a, as an input and give it undue weighting. You can eliminate uh, race. You can just say, tell the AI tool, don't look at race, but then you may have to look at zip code. You may have to look at the name of a school because there may be ways in which the race is actually implicated into the AI tool, into that algorithm in a manner that's not simply as easy as just saying the word race and taking the word and taking race out of uh, the algorithm. It's actually much more complicated than that. So the training set, the data set that's used, just like other data sets that were 
uh, talking, there's a national conversation about algorithmic bias and data sets. Uh, the criminal justice uh, system that uses AI tools uh, really has to be conscious of what data set it's using. Can I give one, do we have time for one more example? Of course. Okay, so the other example that I would just use very quickly is that um, the data set is also reflective of a community standard of what actually constitutes a crime or what constitutes criminal behavior. And there are changing notions of criminal behavior over time. And sometimes those changes happen pretty quickly. So let's just take marijuana as an example. Right now in parts of this country, there's been a legalization of marijuana uh, for recreational use as or for medical use or both. In other parts of the country, it has not uh, been legalized and federally it has not been legalized. So you've got differences in community standards and they could have changed within a short five year period. So if you're using a training set uh, of arrest records for that include, for instance, marijuana based uh, crimes, those may or may not be reflective of what would constitute a crime in a particular jurisdiction at another point in time. So it may give you a uh, sense of criminal behavior that is not reflective truly of what would be violations of the law today. So those are two, two sort of examples. So is it possible then that court rulings or sentences may be overturned based uh, strictly on an alleged bias in the AI system? Well, the first point I think that uh, the courts always want to emphasize is that ultimately in terms of a sentence, a judge, a human judge, is still the ultimate decision maker. And so it's very important uh, to know that we haven't yet in this country turned over uh, any of our sentencing entirely to, uh, to machines. However, it is nonetheless the case that there is information which is being used by courts and used by judges to inform their decision. And there are some serious due process issues uh, that can come up in connection with that. For instance, if a judge is receiving information that suggests that the likelihood of recidivism is very high and receives only the output of an algorithm, but not really all of the guts, and the judge may not want the guts of the algorithm in terms of how that uh, prediction came to be, the judge may be looking at information that suggests, boy, this person may really commit a crime, and then this person may also have a likelihood of violence. I need to take that into consideration. It's hard to imagine that all judges are going to ignore that. The reason the software is being used is so that judges can take that into consideration. So it is reasonable for the defendant who is being confronted with this algorithmic output that's saying, hey, you've got a 95% chance of recidivism guy, and uh, by the way, we think you're gonna be a pretty violent person or that you are violent and are gonna continue to be violent that that individual may want to understand what's underneath this algorithm. Tell me about how and why you came up, you machine uh, program came up with uh, this output for me. And the, right now, there are a number of court challenges that are going on in various places as to whether or not the defendant can actually get a hold uh, of the underlying information. That's one problem. The second problem is very close behind, which is the inability, as we all, as many people in the AI space know, to actually understand the algorithm, even if you've got your hands on it. So with a black box algorithm, uh, where the AI is doing uh, a lot of the work on determining what the inputs are and determining what the weightings are, and it sort of becomes a very complex, recursive kind of learning that the AI is undertaking, at that point, even if you were to transfer all of that information over to the defendant, how in the world are they going to make heads or tails of it? So there's a second problem, due process problem, which is not just requesting and getting the algorithm, but making sense of it once you do. So there are some serious due process issues that will, uh, that will come up there as well. Catherine B. Forrest, former U.S. District Judge for the Southern District of New York, former Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Department of Justice Antitrust Division, and now a partner at Cravath, Swain, and more. Thank you so much for joining us, Catherine. If somebody wants to connect with you, uh, how can they do that? Uh, they could contact me through my professional email. That's the easiest way, and that's just the letter K, 
my last name, Forrest, F-O-R-R-E-S-T, at crevasse.com. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks again for joining us. And find more of my interviews right here or at tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching. Thank you.